Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Guys, welcome back to another episode of Invest Like a Boss. This is your co-host, Sam Marks. This is episode 26. I'm with my buddy, Johnny FD. Hey, hey. We got this episode uh, coming up with Rob Shaw, who is, he's been a mentor of mine for a long time. Someone I look up to professionally as much as anybody out there and uh, a very successful seasoned entrepreneur. Well, I'm really excited to listen to this episode because it's kind of good to kind of know who, you know, like, I guess, I think a lot of people would assume that you've always been successful, that, you, you know, that your very first business ever was the one you sold for, you know, tens of millions of dollars, but everyone starts from somewhere. And you, how, how did you actually meet Rob? So Rob and I met through someone that he had been working with previously. And Rob had just sold his business and wanted to start this new business booked. And I was actually starting and never even got off the ground, but I was building what I wanted to be a trip advisor, but much less commercial. So I had been building that for about two years. Um, I had a, a business partner in that. It never ended up getting off the ground, but it was, you know, it was in the travel industry. And Rob had done a lot of work in real estate, travel, and wanted to build this company booked. So I went down to Miami, met him, and this was literally just a, a concept on paper. But I love Rob. He had, you know, such such incredible experience as a startup founder and then an executive at the company that acquired him and, you know, decided to work for him. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And so you weren't even getting equity in in, in that first business. You were doing it no. primarily to learn or well, actually, they I did end up getting equity as part of the deal. But when I, I left the company about three years later, I, sur- I surrendered the equity. So that is a, a really good, you know, we talk about a lot like join join a startup. And, you know, I know Rob's a big proponent of joining startups is something that he did, you know, way back in the day. But uh, but there's always the opportunity when you join startups to get meaningful stakes of equity. And I had a meaningful stake of, of equity in that company. And, you know, I was an employee, but I also had a meaningful stake of equity, but I surrendered it to go and start SkySig, which worked out in the end. But um, but it was an incredible learning experience. Uh, I don't know if we'll have a chance to talk about it in deep detail on the episode, but just what I've learned from him through processes and tracking metrics and, and things that I never knew when I was you know, getting out of college and building my own startups, uh, I was able to pick up from him during this one I booked. I like it because as we always kind of talk about, even though we love having our money make us money, we need to make that money in the first place to be able to invest. And investing in yourself is you know, really the, the best ROI that you can get. So I'm really excited to yeah. listen to this episode. Yeah, and that's exactly what Rob does. You know, I don't think he's a big investor in other things, but he continues to invest in his new projects, put all of his, you know, put all of his money in his in uh, his faith in himself, um, and he's obviously been able to generate massive returns uh, enough to to never work again. But as uh, I think we'll we'll talk about in the episode, he he has decided to to do again. Yeah, because now, I mean, from what you told me, he's exited what three companies now for a total of a hundred million dollars yeah over i don't know the exact number but it's 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 up there nice so i'm really excited to listen to this and i think everyone can learn something from rob so without further ado here is episode 26 everybody welcome back to invest like a boss this week we have on the show a good friend my mentor and many other things including one of the most successful entrepreneurs i know his name is rob shaw rob welcome to the show buddy Oh, thanks so much. And pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. So you're in Barcelona at the moment, correct? I am. <laughs> Good stuff. Coolest well, city in Europe. That was a big move from you coming from, uh, well, geez, I guess we'll get into it. But you've been in Miami for the last, what, 10 years or so? Mm, I'm actually a little bit older than that. So I've been there <laughs> almost half my life, which is 20 years. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> cool, cool. So Barcelona is awesome. Really exciting city. I know, there's, I know a lot of people... In the entrepreneur space, startup space, engineering, all types of things are moving there, and I'm sure it's I'm sure it's uh, just a really nice place to be, kind of all year round. I've not spent too much time there, but what's your what's your early take on it so far? Well, it, it's really true what you're saying. There's a lot of stuff happening in Barcelona right now. What's cool about it is that you have excellent standard of living and uh, also low cost of living at the same time. So you have mountains, beach, 
you know, all of those things that young people from all of Europe wants to come and, and, and experience in a great climate. And at the same time, the cost of, compared to Paris or London or Berlin is much lower. So that's good for people starting out and it's mm -hmm. good for companies like myself that are trying to, to hire people. Yeah. What's what's like a typical, like what's the labor cost of maybe a full-time, I don't know, entry-level marketer or something? You know, it, it varies a lot based on experience and so forth, but between 20 and 30,000 euros. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way I look at it, comparing from United States, it's half the price in many cases um, compared to what the wages you pay in the United States. So of course, there's a, a few other things that are different in uh, payroll taxes and so forth. But in general, you can have excellent uh, 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 employees here mm -hmm. for fraction of a cost, especially right now when the dollar is very high compared to the euro. So we like to focus on how you got started, of course, how you made your first dollar and achieved, I think you've had three exits now f totaling more than a hundred million dollars, which is incredible. And we'd love to tap into a little bit of that experience. And maybe you could start just with how your story started coming to America. Sure. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Sweden and Sweden is a, a great place, but I was obsessed with being a musician, a rock star, and I had watched this show, The Real World, which was one of the first reality shows, and I wanted to experience that thing, uh, young kids living in a house together. So I had the opportunity to go to uh, the United States for my university, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, in real life, it's not at all as in, in on TV, but you know, I was in a, in a state, I met a girl. Uh, her name is Stacy, and we're still together 20 years later. So that was a fantastic experience. But I also needed to get a job, and 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 in order to stay together, we, we I had to start working. So fortunately, I managed to finish my degree uh, in Sweden, and um, I ended up uh, moving to the back house of my uh, parents-in-law in, -law in uh, Hialeah in mm -hmm. Miami, which is a very Cuban mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood, and. Uh, there I was, a fish out of water. <laughs> so what? So you didn't become a rock star. Instead, you took a job, correct? Yes, my degree was in computer science. So I was, uh, and this was uh, in the mid '90s. So there was a lot of demand for people with that that type of skill, and mm -hmm. I was able to find a corporate job. And I, I, <laughs> I refer to it as my office space time. Mm -hmm. If you guys have uh, seen that movie, um, where you know there are the TPS reports and. <laughs> you know, the corporate corporate uh, minutia and all mm -hmm. that stuff, right? Right. So that was um, so you're working for a company and you're you're doing coding, correct? Yeah, and uh, uh, you know that was what was in, in the end of, of the '90s. So there was the dot com boom that had started, and mm -hmm. uh, you, you basically saw all these people around you that uh, had half baked ideas and they were able to raise money and. Uh, you know, in some cases, sell their businesses for a lot of money. So obviously, you, 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 I paid a lot of attention to that and felt like I should be able to do something like that too. But I didn't have any money. I had zero experience being an entrepreneur. Like you know, I essentially just arrived in the United States a few years earlier. So mm -hmm. I, I needed something to get started. Right. So, so this at this point, what was your your job? Uh, like, what company were you working for? It was just in. It was down in Miami. You said right. Yeah, it was a company was doing uh, uh, copier tracking. You, you can tell how exciting it sounds, right? For law firms. <laughs> I don't even want to you expand know. on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was a great company, and I, I made some great friends there. Actually, my my current business partner Ben Strom is uh, we we met there, and I learned a lot about enterprise software. But it was not anything that uh, was going to change my future in mm -hmm. any way, right? Um, and I. You know, saw people being laid off. I saw people, you know, trying to climb the corporate ladder, and I was like, mm -hmm, I, I don't think I want to do that that thing anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, I started looking for entrepreneurial opportunities, and I ended up just starting to work for another startup. I think that's just something for for listeners out there that are trying to figure out how they can become an entrepreneur, and they don't have the money, they don't have connections, they don't have the the expertise. Join someone else. I mean, that's the fastest and best way to learn, right? Right. And I think also that goes along with that. There's always the opportunity to potentially get a meaningful stake of equity when you do something like that. Yeah. And in, in, in this particular case, the company that I joined, um, A, I wasn't even smart enough to understand that I did not get any significant stake of equity. <laughs> but at the same time, I uh, 
was for the first time, you know, seeing the, the steps of raising money, of trying to create a value proposition for a new company and mm-hmm. so forth. And that company ended up not being successful. But, you know, I learned a lot during that year I was working there. And again, you know, coincidences, like this is one of the things that I think is the most important in life is that if you don't do something, nothing will happen. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that came out of that uh, experience in that startup was that I met uh, my first co-founder, a, a guy named Joel Falman, mm-hmm. and we basically said, hey, this company didn't work out, but perhaps we, you and I can do, do something together. Mm-hmm. And instead of trying to raise money, this the, the whole implosion of dot-com had already uh, come and gone at that point. So we said, let's just try to create a company that does not need to raise any money. Let's just start selling some services. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was not, you know, it was like more like a consultant company at that point, but that was how we could, uh, could get started even in a bad time, so to speak. This was in 2001, uh, so it was right around the time of 9-11 and all of these things where people were really depressed about the economy and so mm-hmm. That was the time when we started and, and it still worked out great. So the company that you said was not successful that you joined as a startup uh, and you met Joel through that company, did that company successful in raising money but then just failed in the end? It was one of those things where timing was of, of the essence, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they had raised a little bit of money. I think they had raised six dollars $700,000. And then they were trying to raise a lot of money uh, at a very high valuation. Mm-hmm. And that works sometimes, but it does not work all the time. And that team and that product and that timing was not successful. So that they were basically running out of money as we were uh, exiting out of that company. And that was also at the, was that in and around the time of the dot-com bust? Yes. So it was in 2001. Oof, tough time, tough time to be raising money, I guess, if you're on the yeah. tail end of it. Yeah. But it was also a, a great time to start a business mm-hmm. because there were other things that were coming out of that. And that those were the, again, you know, a lot of this stuff comes down to luck and being, being at the right time at the right place. Mm-hmm. So what Joel and I did was we looked at hey, what's hot right now? What, what is happening? And we looked at, and he, Joel just said out of the blue, I like real estate. And he, I said, well, I like real estate too. Mm-hmm. And that was like the amount of analysis that went into this stuff. And we decided that we were going to start a technology company focusing on real estate. And okay, so what was that company? And what was the name? And what did it do? The, that company was called Rechannel Communications. Mm-hmm. And basically, it was providing websites for real estate agents and brokers. Mm-hmm. So We started talking to some realtors and they said, well, why would you do that? There's tons of companies out there making websites for real estate agents. And we were like, oh, we hadn't even done the research at that point. So we were kind of surprised, Mm -hmm. but we did the research and we did notice that there was one thing that none of those real estate websites that other people were making had. And that was all the listings uh, in the the area. Mm -hmm. Those real estate websites up to that point were only listing the agent's own listings. So you could go on their website and find 20 listings. But what good does that do for you if you're looking for a home? You want to look for, for all of them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And again, timing and luck plays a lot of, like many people forget about that that is a big part of their success or, or their, their failures. Mm-hmm. And in this case, it was something that played in our favor. At that particular time, the rules around the realtor, uh, real, real estate association in the United States changed. Mm-hmm. And something called MLS, which is the central repository of the listings, mm-hmm. they were forced to make this data available. So the thing that we did differently from, from all the other companies out there were that we started to take this data from the MLSs, process it, and make it available on our customers' websites. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple of other companies out there doing this, but they were doing it just for one or two or three MLSs. And we said, hey, let's try to do it for all MLSs. And because we were able to create a scalable process around that, we created a company that had value. And how long did it take you to build that, that company up to the level and achieve your eventual exit? So it took, took three years, mm-hmm. more or less. And part of that was like uh, a couple of our lessons from that whole thing was... Joel and I had never been uh, startup entrepreneurs before, mm-hmm. and we really didn't know what to do. So the thing that changed things around for us was we brought in a third partner. His name was Brian Shapiro, 
And he was the guy that had the entrepreneurial expertise from before, and he was able to help us set up the process for how to sell, how to build the support team and so forth that, mm-hmm. that we did not have. And again, people matters when you, you create your your businesses and, and, and finding people that have complementing skills is super important in your founding team. So at this point, were, you, were the majority of your skills still on the, the computer and coding side or had you developed significant business skills to apply to, to the operations? I, I think that, you know, as you're involved in a business on a day-to-day business basis, you pick up more and more. At that point, I was my title CTO, Chief Technical Officer. Mm-hmm. So my responsibility was definitely around the technology of it. But at the same time, I was an owner of a business and I wanted it to be successful and I wanted to understand what drove the success or failure of sales and support and so forth. So I I brought in my skills during that period. So a lot of people are always, including myself, trying to figure out how exits come about. And you hear, you read every day in, in the in the tech news, so and so was bought, so and so was acquired, and you're just like sitting there. Did Google write this company by their customer support channel? Did someone come knock on their office door and say, "Hey, we're thinking about acquiring you"? And it's always a different story, but. How did it happen for you guys? How did, how did the actual first contact of, of the exit get started? That, that's a great question. So like in two, so I said I did this for three years. So in 2003, like two years into it, like one day I went home and told my wife, hey, I think we're millionaires. And by the way, we had no money when we started this thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and she's like looking at me and like laughing, like we're millionaires? No, for sure not, right? And I said, I think that the company is actually worth, I, I owed a third of it. And I think it's company's worth more than $3 million at this point. And she's like just laughing. Uh, and then six months later, exactly what you're talking about happened. An email came in from a local company in South Florida and say, hey, uh, we've seen what you guys are doing on this uh, uh, listing aggregation and the websites. And uh, uh, would you like to have dinner with us or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when we had dinner, it was pretty clear that they were interested in buying us. And we started talking. And of course, like in all negotiations, you don't start on the same number. But we were able to make a deal happen. And uh, it was, uh, you know, very much a life-changing experience for for all people involved. Because all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about rent for the next month and and so forth right like you can you can start planning out your life a little bit differently after that right so how old were you when you got had this first exit i think i was 31 nice and then what what happens next you get us you get a check in the bank and then where do you go from there well yeah so you know again just to kind of tie back to the last one i mean people say this thing companies are are bought not sold right so in this particular case we had something special and they came to us Mm -hmm. and that company you know what was a leader in the real estate technology world? It was a company called E Neighborhoods, and uh, I immediately liked the guys, the founding guys at that company, and I ended up working for them for three years as a, as an executive. And during that time, what I didn't have in my previous company was a lot of connections in the real estate industry. We just had our customers; uh, they they knew everybody, uh, all the large uh, companies uh, like Remax, Century Twenty One. Uh, uh, etc. And we ended up getting contracts with them to do their national sites. So that was very exciting to to do websites like Remax.com, what you see in a TV commercial, and see that that's your technology, your ideas that are actually being advertised on on TV. Uh, so we, we did that for a few years. And then, uh, what what was your title when you were working for? It was E Neighborhoods, you said, correct? Yeah, I, I was a vice president of of technology there. So the, I have a, uh, you know, one of the questions I've always wanted to ask you, uh, not to not to jump ahead too much, is is what is, you know, you've worked as a startup CEO, you've worked as a co-founder, bootstrapping, you know, on a small budget, and then you've had these acquisitions and you become executive, and the, you know that's got to be a totally different experience with a lot of pros and cons on both sides, right? Yeah. So. The, the thing that I always say when people ask that question is that as a startup uh, uh, founder, you have to make everything happen yourself. You have to send out the emails. You have to pick up the phone. You have to get things started all over the place. As an executive, it's the other way around. Things hit you. Every morning when you open up your inbox, you have 10 crises there that you have to deal with. 
And your, your job is, is very different. You have to make sure that you find people that can help you resolve each one of those. And you obviously have to usually have to deal with a much larger budget and a large, much larger organization. And that's the other thing of it, right? When it's a startup, you have zero resources, but anything can happen. Mm -hmm. You can make anything happen through sheer will, basically. As an executive, you have all these resources, but trying to make something happen is like you know the proverbial herding cats because mm -hmm. you have to convince so many people that this is an important initiative so hopefully you know over time you 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 pick skills on both of those and i think that you know feedback that people have given me is that my stronger area is in, in the startup area versus the executive but it is it's very exciting to to grow an organization within a, a, a large large organization and and see things like, like you know a national brand adopting your technology and so forth. So what happens next on on the your path through everything that you've been through and everything you've you've achieved? You're now an executive at E Neighborhoods and you're growing that company. What what's the next stages? Well, the same thing happened again, you know, it just was a larger company that came to us again and said, "Hey, we really like what you have. You have some impressive technology, you have some impressive accounts and they ended up making an offer to the founding team uh, and we uh, accepted it and had another exit, basically. Was that anywhere as exciting as the the first exit? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is always <laughs> exciting to, 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 to do a deal like that mm -hmm. because you never know how these things are going to happen. You're, you're, you're part of the due diligence process. You understand that everything you're saying, everything you're showing, like it's going to be scrutinized and you're hoping that like, like what you're built and what you have is holding up to that scrutiny. And when it does, then you're, of course, very excited. What was the valuation of that, that deal, that transaction? That company, that company was in the range of six, 60 to $70 million. And is that company still alive and viable today? Yes, it's cool. part of a, a much larger organization called Dominion Enterprises. Nice. So, uh, same question again. What age were you? What year were you? Was this that this all took place? Uh, I was thirty-five at that point, so it was four years later. So, at this point, you've got two exits under your belt. You have one as purely startup co-founder, and then the next one as an executive at the acquiring company of your startup. So. What do you do from here? This is when I think you start the next company book, which was actually a company I worked for going back, oh my gosh, like eight years, I think. But how did that get started? Did you just jump into it? Like what was the whole process there? Well, I mean, it, it had to do with wanting to take the next step in my career and become um, a CEO of a company. Um, and it was also this, this whole idea that hey, if you can work with something that you're really interested in, wouldn't that be cool? And I was really interested in travel and real estate and vacation rentals, which was what the industry you ended up uh, working in was exactly the right intersection between those two things. Right. So I, when I started with you guys almost at the beginning, but I never had a chance to actually ask you questions about you know, about how it got started, how you met Ben. Now I know a little bit more of that backstory. And with this new business booked, were you able to leverage, you know, your previous network from the other businesses and some of those resources or was this more from, from scratch? Well, what I was able to leverage was my confidence. You know, I had already been successful twice before, so I figured I would, you know, this would be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, startups are never easy. And uh, the, the networks that I had were not 100% applicable, but people did help me. You know, people made introductions to people that could help and so forth. And that's one of those things that I always try to do now. Um, if I can connect you with someone, uh, perhaps that could lead to something else. And I think many people that are afraid to start something, they, they don't ask for those kind of connections and they don't follow through on them. And that's oftentimes a big mistake. Uh, of course, every single connection and every single uh, introduction does not lead to anything. But mm -hmm. if you don't follow through on them, you have zero chance of success. Yeah, I learned so much from working with you and especially about processes and, you know, also how to how to get through good times and bad times and kind of keeping, you know, keeping your emotional level pretty flat. Not, not get too high, not get too low, and really how to, you know, to refine, uh, refine processes. And also the importance of one thing that you've always said to me that I always took and applied to my other businesses was what gets measured gets managed. And I think that is one of the most important things that startups can do at an early stage is make sure that they 
they start tracking KPIs and important points um, in their data and their in their uh, in their key metrics. Absolutely, and also owning those, like providing. You know, one of the things that made you a star employee was that you owned your KPIs. Uh, and helping your employees understand that it's not just about tracking, it's also about owning. What can you do to make those numbers better? And then, of course, giving people the ability, autonomy to, to, to make changes as needed. Mm-hmm. There are so many good stories that came out of that company. Some of, the, uh, some of the travel, some of the events we did, the office space we shared, growing the team. It was a really great you know, classic startup experience that eventually led to an exit just not uh, not so recently, 2013, correct? Early 2014. Early 2014. So take us through a little bit of that. Like how did, you know, how did that deal get done? And, you know, what was the experience? This startup was a self-funded startup and it took some time to kind of build a product. We had a small team. Uh, it was fun, but it was, you know, not something we've scaled in in one or two years. Uh, so we worked on this for a few years, and we kind of did a pivot where we were fortunate again to uh, to do a partnership with TripAdvisor, mm-hmm. and they, that really helped us. We we uh, I actually ended up acquiring a another smaller business that was a partner of ours, uh, and I brought some great people along with that. And with with these new people and like a partnership with TripAdvisor, we were able to, to turn it from kind of a one-off product to um, uh, a SaaS product that was very scalable. Mm-hmm. And we started selling that all over the world, actually. Um, and, and once that, that happened, we knew that we had something uh, good and we benchmarked ourselves against the competitors in the industry. We knew that the industry was very large. So the vacation rental industry is over $100 billion annually. And we could get a, a slice of that business. So we were very confident about the business prospects. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, uh, every day uh, in a startup, you have new challenges and you want to grow faster and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, uh, Again, third time, in a, in a, like someone came to us and say, hey, you guys are, are working on something exciting. We, we like the vacation rental industry. And uh, uh, would you be interested in joining us and, and selling the business? OK, so you mentioned the contact, right? But I'm still curious. Yeah. Is like, is that an email that goes through like your customer service queue and is like, dear, dear p- friends at Booked, like, <laughs> or is it a phone okay, call? No, or what? I'm going to tell you exactly. OK, this is a great question again. And I'm going to tell you exactly how this happened. And for the listeners out there, it's not going to happen exactly the same way for you, but it is. it teaches you a lesson. I had sold a previous business we talked about, and I met some people there, and I became friendly with them. And like, like you know, you stay in t- contact. One of those uh, guys, his name is Jamie Clymer, he um, ended up sending me an email asking about vacation rentals two, three years later. And I just said, yeah, I started the business related to vacation rentals. Uh, are you interested in learning more? I didn't hear anything from him for, on, in a, for over a year. Mm-hmm. And then just one day, he just emailed me back and said, hey, you know, are you still doing the vacation rental thing? And I said, yeah, here's the company. And we had a call. Um, I explained to him what I was doing at the time, which was to try to raise a series A for the company so that we could expand faster and so forth. And mm-hmm. he said, why don't you sell the business to us instead? <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great response to hear. Yeah. Cool, man. That was awesome. So that was another, so that was a third exit. And, you know, take us through what happens next, becoming an executive again. Yeah. So this time it was a little different. Uh, this time I was the uh, head uh, of, of a, a division uh, with P&L responsibility. Um, and uh, it was a company named RealPage. Uh, it's headquartered in Texas, and the, the people there are some awesome people. Um, you really got to see how the big machine, how a large uh, public company operates, mm-hmm. and uh, that was extremely exciting, but also very different from, from a startup environment. Things like revenue recognition that you never care about in a, in a startup is, is a big deal. So the money that is coming in may not count to your PL for, for many reasons. And uh, that's just stuff that you have to learn. Uh, you have so many different departments, you have to interact with all of them. But again, I thought it was a, an extremely exciting uh, opportunity. And what ended up happening was that we had, um, 
uh, also bought our biggest competitor, was a company uh, headquartered here in Barcelona uh, named Kegel. So all of a sudden, we had two vacation rental software businesses. And Kegel was a little bit larger than we. They already had uh, close to 100 employees. So I ended up uh, volunteering. I guess I should say, to go to Europe and become the general manager for this uh, office here in, here in Barcelona. And again, very exciting experience. I got to meet uh, and work with some great people here. So again, you're, you go from startup to executive. And then how long were you with the new company for, with RealPage for, which is a public, public company, I believe? Yeah, yeah. I ended up being there for two years. And it was so that was between Dallas and Miami, or yeah, we had we had an office in in Miami. Uh, I spent a lot of time going back and forth between Miami and Dallas. Uh, I racked up a lot of airline miles, mm -hmm. um, but obviously travel is is very tiring when you're away from your family and so forth. But mm -hmm. what was what was cool was that uh, RealPage is a global company. They have an office in Manila, so I got to 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 go there mm -hmm. and work with them, uh, their team there. I worked uh, with a team in India, and of course with uh, the people here in Barcelona and mm -hmm. the States. So you you really get an experience for how a large company can be put together. Uh, uh, from a global standpoint. So that you just took us through three exits that you built and were part of. And I don't know, I don't know what the course of time was, maybe about 10 years or so, would you say was, was the duration of all that stuff? Yeah, approximately. So I want to get into where you're at now, where that's led you to be, but I have a few questions, uh, we'll call it a half dozen questions on kind of what you've learned from, from all that, those experiences. You cool for a, a few, uh, rapid fire questions, kind of in quick concession. Yeah. So, all right. So first off was early on, did you have any mentors when you, you know, when you, you, you started, uh, you didn't start a company, you joined a startup. Did you have any mentors or how did you learn your business intellect early on? No, I did not have any mentors when I started the company and I should have had, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I told you that we added up third co-founder and he became a mentor. He's actually younger than me, but he knew so many things that I did not know at that mm -hmm. point. So I was able to learn a lot from him. And I know that he, his mentor was his dad, who was a successful entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And again, that just goes to show how like, being around the right people can uh, be very, very beneficial for you. So what do you know now through all that you've been through startup founding to big public company, corporate executive, you've done everything from CTO to managing, not necessarily managing profit loss, but managing the statements or the, the actual account? Uh, PL mm -hmm. statement is a, is a term that you use mm -hmm. in a public company that uh, accounts for the income and, and the expenses for your division. Right. And then that gets rolled up with all the other divisions in your in your organization. And that becomes the public company's p &L statement that they uh, release on earnings release every quarter. Got it. So you've got a wide variety of experience from CEO to managing PL, doing the, all the, the, the CTO and technical work. What do you know now that you wish you had applied to your startups earlier that could have helped them grow quicker? Uh, you, you, I mean, that's obviously an enormous amount of things that you learn during that journey. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the thing that I also know now is how hard it is to become successful in a startup. Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes makes you think twice about certain things. And sometimes you kind of want to go back to that naivety, but you're 25, 30, 26 years old, and mm -hmm. you just want to do something, and everything seems so easy. So, I mean, having that experience is a double-edged sword. Now you you know all the crap that's going to come your your way as you're doing whatever you're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. So anything specific that, you know, around people or finances or, well, or planning that I, you think I, I is mean, I like this show. I don't know if the people in the U.S. they see this show. It's called. Um, it's with a guy named Mark Limonis, mm -hmm. and it's called. Uh, do you remember? I can't even remember what it's called. No, now. I don't know it. Anyways, um, it, he talks about three things: people, process, and product. Mm -hmm. And people is definitely the most important thing. Like your co-founders are critical. You want to be involved in that. And the, the key early people need to be smart. Need to be dedicated. They need to have the right work ethic. Mm -hmm. And if they have the specific experience, that is less important because smart people can learn new things. Got it. And then on the processes we talked about already, KPIs and so forth. And then, of course, on the product that you like, the thing that I learned over time is that the product that has the most features are usually not the winner. The product that is the most reliable, the one that solves the 
key things can go much further than the one that has all the bells and whistles. That's interesting perspective, definitely to be considered for anybody building technology or building platforms, certainly something I'll, I'll consider for things that we're doing as well. Um, what advice would you have for people who they're ambitious to start their own, let's say a digital business, not any, you know, not a sandwich shop, but they want to start a digital business. You know, this is very much becoming a new digital freelance economy. What advice would you have for anyone who hasn't gotten started yet? Build something, see, show it to people, get their feedback, learn the basics of internet marketing, the, you know, how to use social media, how to use Google analytics, how to use Google AdWords, all these different things that I did not know when I started at this, uh, this first business and uh, could have just made uh, some things go much faster if I had. Okay, very nice. Now, you mentioned that people is one of the most important ingredients when starting a business, uh, especially co-founders and early employees. What are some of the qualities that you look for you know, when you're, when you're hiring your first set of employees, is it more of a feeling of who that person is or is it particular skills? So I used to hire on, only on feeling mm -hmm. and uh, I realized that you project your own mood and your own feeling around a person onto that into you and then, and therefore you won't be consistent in your evaluation of the candidate. So what I started doing is a, essentially a checklist of, of questions that I ask every single uh, thing and they related around uh, communication, specific skills that I know the um, position requires and things like work ethic and past performance and so forth. And then I try to create a score around that and use that as a more objective way to measure whether I think the person has a good likelihood to be successful in the role. And since I started using that, I think I've been making smart hiring decisions than I did before when it was, hey, a charismatic, engaging person comes in and you, you get attracted to that and a person that's maybe a little more quiet or reserved does not get a chance based, mm -hmm. that they deserve basically. Gotcha. All right. So now on to an investing question. You've invested basically time and time again in yourself, done extremely, extremely well. Is there any type of other investments that you're either doing or that interests you in the future, such as startup investing, angel investing, property, et cetera? Yes. Uh, I've done a little bit of real estate investment and, and I'm doing a startup uh, investment right now, a company called coworker.com that you might be familiar with. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so in coworker, uh, just to clarify, Sam is, is the, uh, one of the co-founders of coworker. Uh, and the reason I'm investing in coworker is one, because of you, Sam, I, I, I've seen how well you've done for yourself and for the companies that you have been uh, working on. Second thing is that um, I think that co-working is a mega trend. It's one of those exciting things that is just growing and growing right now. Uh, I'm right now working at a co-working space myself, so I know uh, exactly what people are looking for when they're when they're selecting a co-working space. And thirdly, it's a, tangentially related to, to real estate and travel and, and these things that I've worked with in the past. And hopefully I can be of some assistant uh, as an investor and advisor. And so what type of investment philosophies do you have or maybe what type of opportunities do you look for now that you don't need to hustle for money? You can, you know, you can, you can basically invest at will on things that you might that might be appealing to you or that you think could potentially have a big return for you. Right. So I think that uh, people tend to forget that markets go up the stairs and down the elevator. And that means that uh, uh, at some point, markets come down quickly. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, uh, a couple of times I've been burned myself. I was lucky in 2008 selling all my assets because I was starting a new startup and I felt like I needed cash on hand if I was uh, doing that. And of course, we all remember what happened later in 2008. Yeah. And uh, I usually apply the Kramer test. Uh, if you have watched Jim Kramer on, on Fast, <laughs> uh, what was it called, Man Money? Yeah, yeah. We were talking about him last, on last episode. Yeah. It's funny. So it's a pretty easy, easy test. If, if Jim is happy, then I get nervous because probably market is, is uh, very, you know, high and overvalued. And if Jim is crazy and saying that the world is falling apart, perhaps that's the time when you should start uh, looking at buying new assets. So is going forward in the future, you mentioned you're starting to do some angel investing. Is there anything else that you particularly would want to invest in? Again, I, I think that anything that I can add value to mm -hmm. is, uh, and where I 
have a some kind of connection to the founders. Yeah. That's that's really where I where I would want to put my money. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that would be in the, in the software s internet services type of space. Got it. How about any favorite books uh, on business or startups that you've read or in, over the course of years? Well, the th the book that like kind of put my personal philosophy or helped me shape that is the Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson. It's just a super, uh, you know, fun book to read. Yeah. But a book that is actually, you know, more practical if, if you want to be uh, an entrepreneur and investor is a book called How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis. Okay. It's, it sounds very crass and it sounds like some kind of cheesy self-help book but it's actually very very smart and it talks about the specifics that you should be doing in different situations you know negotiation situations and so forth and i remember it's, you know, prior to one of my deals that i was doing and i had a tricky negotiation i picked up that book i read the whole negotiation chapter one more time and then i actually followed the playbook in that and it ended up being a favorable outcome for me. So you know what book you also I really like that. You gave me a book when I first started working with you way back when. It was called The Art of the Start. And you're the only other person I've ever even heard had that book. And I read it. I loved it. And I think that's where I learned how to put together like a, a good to the point PowerPoint presentation. I think I still have that book, by the way. Well, I gave you another book too, the four hour work week. And that was a huge mistake because after I gave you that book, I couldn't think of anything else than to to be a, a <laughs> global nomad no, no, and you ended up, we ended up uh, parting ways a year later or so, something like that. So another tip, be careful with what kind of books you give to your to your coworkers. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I still have that book too. Thank you very much. And we love that book. Uh, of course, it's it's a big part of our philosophy on the on the podcast. And um, and I know some of your own personal philosophy as well. I'm sure. So that takes us to where where are you now, man? I know you're in Barcelona. You have a, a new exciting company that I'm actually also uh, investing in that you're working on on closing a round for. But tell me about or tell us rather about you know artificial intelligence and you know, a little bit about your new company. Right. So the company is named CN. Uh, CN means 100 in Spanish. And we used to say that uh, we want to do something that is 100 times better than anything we've done in the past. It is all about sales productivity. In our last company, we went from two salespeople to 100 salespeople. And again, very exciting times. But productivity of those salespeople went down and down and down. And I was trying to figure out why that was. And uh, Salesforce.com could not help me figure that out. Excel spreadsheets that I put together myself, I couldn't figure it out. So I figured that this is, must be a problem that you can apply artificial intelligence or something called machine learning to. And um, that's, that's really what we're doing right now to, to help salespeople become much more productive and measure things that really matter. So it goes back to this whole measure what what matters or ma what gets managed what gets measured gets managed mantra mm -hmm. and so you're planning on building that office there in barcelona now oh, you got your family there and ben your, ben's your co-founder in this one as well yeah so ben is my co-founder in this business too and yeah we we moved our families to barcelona now we're setting up our product development team here and we are uh, very excited to be here. So you don't need to, I mean, you obviously don't need to work. You could retire tomorrow and I know Ben could as well. So what's the drive to, you know, to getting back into startups and, and building something that you know is going to put you back into a stressful field of work, you know, pretty much day in, day out? Well, I think, you know, one aspect is that, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s now. I think that if I want to do another startup, I should do it now versus when I'm in a 50s or 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that is one aspect of it. Another thing is that it's fun, you know, creating something from scratch and, and, and building it, um, especially when you, when you have the confidence that you, 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 you should be able to, to be successful in this stuff. It's, it's fun. Of course, then like in all startups in all ventures, uh, reality hits you from time to time, right? Oh, this is not going as well as I hoped here in this particular case and so forth. And, and, I mean, that's going to, I'm sure, happen in this in, in this business too. But then you just have to kind of go back to your core values and remember that, you know, you just have to kind of push through. Yeah, sounds great. Well, Rob, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your experience um, through three exits, over $100 million in 
sales or not sales, but in, um, well, in transaction money, a pretty incredible experience. And I love the perspective of be, both being a startup co-founder and going working as an executive for the acquiring company after the acquisition. I think that's a perspective that is very unique, um, at least in our circles and the amount of business intellect that you could get from something like that is, you know, very unique as well. So thanks for coming on, sharing all that. We're really excited to see how Cien goes. Please keep us updated on that. And um, we'll be sure to include notes uh, in the show notes and links to all your material, some of your old businesses in uh, in the show notes on Invest Like a Boss. Well, thank you for having me. It's been really fun to be on the show. All right, buddy. Well, good luck. Keep in touch and um, invest like a boss or do startups like a boss. <laughs> Sounds good. Man, that was another great episode. I've learned so much more about you, Sam, than I have known. I mean, I've known you now for way, well over a year, and we've been hanging out. We, you know, traveled across Europe together, and I actually never knew that beginning part of your journey. So that was really cool. Yeah, and you know, even doing that episode, I think there's a lot more takeaways that have been kind of hardened in me. And and one is, I think everybody, you know, that's young out there that's trying to develop skills, they should all consider joining a startup because generally when you join a startup you know there's there's obviously all the benefits and of being in a high growth energetic organization but out of that you're usually going to get some type of mentor somebody who's you know either raised money done it before um or really talented and to join in and see how those organizations are run and how they you know how they grow i think is an invaluable experience for someone anyone that's young out there yeah i definitely think so cuz i mean as you kind of mentioned one of the best ways to learn is to be surrounded by other people who already know how to do it and you know are already successful. But normally, you know, people don't have time to show you the ropes. But if you're working for them, they kind of have to show you how to do everything because they, they need it to, to get done. And a great example of this is my intern Anthony, who, who edits these podcasts. He started, you know, six months ago, knowing nothing about podcast editing or running a location independent business. And now he's actually thinking about starting a podcast production company, just because he has all these people contacting him saying, "Hey, I know you you edit the Invest Like a Boss." And Travel Like a Boss podcast, can you, can you also do mine? We love you, Anthony. Don't leave us, buddy. <laughs> but it kind of just shows that, you know, you can, you can get the skills of, you know, of kind of what your mentors would teach you uh, by working for them. And the win-win situation would be him saying, well, you know what, let me, you know, let me, you know, continue editing these podcasts um, while I outsource um, right. kind of like a production company to, for other people. So like, right. you know, if other people want to start, he can kind of oversee everything. And to be honest, like, even if he had someone else, you know, doing some of the grunt work, uh, and he was kind of overseeing it to make sure the quality levels were super high, mm-hmm. then I'd be okay with that. Yeah, for sure. Johnny, when was the last time you worked for a company? <sighs> um, I didn't, I haven't officially worked for a company since Honeywell and that was like 2006 or 2007. Uh, but I have worked kind of alongside other people uh and i and i learn a lot from that so you know like mm-hmm. a lot of times i would kind of just like to be honest i'll just like help out so every year i help out with the drop shipping retreat and this year is in hawaii so i just got back from that a few days ago actually and mm-hmm. i don't officially work for the company i don't you know i don't get paid uh to help out with it but i've helped with their retreats three years in a row now uh you know one in chiang mai one in Krabi, now in hawaii and people kind of just assume that I'm helping out with the retreat, even though I really have nothing to do with it. But I learned so much from kind of being behind the scenes and, you know, and being, you know, alongside uh, people doing it. Yeah. So imagine that drop shipping store that you sold, what was it, six months ago or something? Around there, yeah. So imagine as part of that deal, you had to go work for the acquiring company for two years. How do you think that you would feel about that? I probably want to do it on such a small scale. I think it was a much bigger uh, project. Mm-hmm. I would... I wouldn't do it for two years, but I would probably do it for, you know, what, three to six months to, to transition away. Uh, yeah. But I, I would have to actually get paid a lot more. So it's funny that you bring that up because my original buyer for my job shipping store offered more money than what I sold it for. So I sold it for about 60000 but the original buyer wanted to give me sixty five, but with the caveat that I stay on board for two months. And two months is way shorter than two years. But even then, mm-hmm. I was thinking, for that extra $5,000, it's not worth my time staying on for two months, especially yeah. because the whole point of me selling it was to be able to take a break. Yeah. And that's often often the scenario that happens when companies get bought and they make an offer to keep the 
you know, the founders or the, the executives and directors on with the, with the new acquiring company. And that's always a big sticking point because oftentimes, not all, every time, but oftentimes the founders or the directors just want to be done, right? They're selling it. They will wipe their hands clean and be gone. But what I really love about Rob's experience is twice he sold businesses and then stayed on with his companies for multiple years. And they're, they're large companies. Uh, and you know, I envy that experience because when I sold, uh, when we sold sky sig, it was done. The light switch was on, it went off the next day I was done. And you know, that would have been going and working for a large tobacco company. And I can't say that I, I had the drive to do it at that point, but you know, looking back, the experience of working in a huge public company, uh, like a tobacco company or a real page like Rob has done as, at an executive level, man, it's just such a different experience than running a, you know, a, a small, medium-sized startup. Yeah, I definitely can see you know that corporate experience would be super interesting, if not you know also beneficial. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think that's the type of route I would personally go to, uh, but it is kind of fun to to see that that side of it. But I'll say that the the couple things aside from that that I learned from the episode was definitely he kind of reiterated how important it is to invest in yourself and how big of an ROI mm-hmm. you can get from that. But more importantly, mm-hmm. to invest in people that you know and you trust. And I, I think, you know, some of the best deals out there, you know, were to get in kind of early on a, you know, if you wanted to invest in a startup or into a business, a lot of times, you know, you're investing in the person, not necessarily the product or the metrics they have so far. Yeah, totally agree. And I'm also investing in one of Rob's new company. I think we chatted about just lightly on the show. It's an artificial intelligence company. If you guys want to check out, it's called CN. It's basically artificial intelligence for business for business sales team. Um, we'll leave a link to that in the show notes. But that's actually going back to the episode with Josh on the IRAs that yeah, I'm turning my entire IRA into being self-directed and I'm going to invest all that into Rob's new company. So Rob, if you're listening, no pressure. You're literally gambling with my entire retirement. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's uh, crazy. But, you know, it's yeah, it's it's uh, so th- you know another good takeaway from the podcast and being able to to transition my IRA into self directed and then being able to invest in Rob's new company. Yeah, so if you guys want to take a li- listen to that episode to see how that's kind of possible and, and what are the tax implications of that, I think that's really cool that you're actually you know jumping on that and the fact that you know uh, Rob personally and that he has such a good tr- you know great track record, I-, I can definitely see why you're going to invest in this new company. All right, guys. So if you want to hear episode number 18, that's the one with Josh and we talk about IRAs and how to get them self-directed so that you can do fancy things like invest in startups like I am now with Rob, uh, where if there is a positive outcome, the gain of all that will be tax free um, through my IRA. That's super cool. So the other two things that I took away from this episode was one is always having some cash on hand. So if you know, I think he got a little bit lucky taking that cash out, you know, right before two thousand eight, before the the market mm-hmm. correction. But in general, I think it's a good idea to always have, you know, a random number I'm throwing out there is about fifty thousand dollars, you know, to be able to not only live for a few years mm-hmm. if there is you know ups and downs, and especially like the stock market. So you don't want all your money in it, you know, where you can't touch it. You always want to have some cash, but also to be able to invest into different business opportunities as they come up. Mm-hmm. And if and if you have all your money and investments that are locked in long term, especially in things like index funds, where when it's low, it's you not, you know, you can't sell it or you shouldn't be selling it. Or if you mm-hmm. have things that are locked into, you know, 12 month or 36 month um, windows where you can't get the money out, then you're kind of screwed. So I, I think that was a really smart thing for him to do. Yeah, I agree completely. So do we have another winner this week for those wonderful reviews we've been left? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, for this week, let's see. Well, actually, so it's going to be this month. Happy uh, November, everyone. Uh, this month's winner for the $25 Amazon gift card is going to be Andy Wu. And he wrote, I really enjoyed listening to this podcast because it contains many interesting subjects related to finance and investing. I know where there are tons of other similar podcasts, but Johnny and Sam are providing the unique perspectives and, and real life examples. These guys walk the talk. Great podcast for those who take action. I, I, it was cut off, but I think that's what it says. <laughs> Thanks for the review. Guys, if you haven't yet, please take a second to leave us a review. It's how we get better and better guests to come on the show and share their knowledge and experience with all of us. Yep. 
uh, just log on to iTunes, into the iTunes app or the store, or click, if you're listening on your phone, maybe you can just click on it and see if you can leave a review there. Or if you listen anywhere else, leave a review there as well. And if you want to submit your screenshot of your review to be entered in to win a $25 Amazon gift card, which we give away every single month, uh, go ahead and just email that in. Uh, and instructions are at investlikeaboss.com. Just click on bonus and you can see how you can enter to win. Thank you guys so much. And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.